So we now have an, uh, we have an explicit formula for optimal stimulus spending uh, as a function of sufficient statistics. And so now we can look at it and try to see a little bit how uh, the size of the optimal stimulus package um, depends on um, the unemployment gap that the economy is facing, the elasticity of substitution between public and private goods, how we, you know how well public goods substitute for private goods, as well as the unemployment multiplier, you know how um, efficacious public spending is at reducing uh, unemployment. Um, so what we showed is that the form we showed that we can obtain a formula. Uh, for optimal stimulus spending. We showed that this formula uh, took this form. So what we showed earlier is that uh, stimulus spending, so the gap between uh, public spending and the Samuelson spending, GC star, uh, so it's going to be uh, two epsilon, the elasticity of substitution, and the unemployment multiplier divided by one plus z. Z is just uh, uh, a constant that depends on um, the efficient unemployment as well as Samuelson spending. Uh, it's positive times epsilon m square, and then all of this is times the initial unemployment gap, u0 minus u star over u star. Uh, so that's what we saw. So now we can ask, uh, we can you know, kind of look a little bit at how optimal stimulus spending depends on the different sufficient statistics. Um, so first, the, we can rule, look at uh, the role of the unemployment gap. Uh, I guess the role of the initial unemployment gap on the design of optimal stimulus spending. So that's u0 minus u star over u star. Over, you know, I mean, you can also just, uh, oh, you know, we can just, uh, in fact, the initial unemployment gap, we can just say it's the standard way to think about an unemployment gap, which is u0 minus u star. Um, so what's the impact of the unemployment gap uh, the initial unemployment gap, well, here we can see immediately, right, uh, uh, stimulus spending, GC minus GC star, how much you increase public spending over <coughs> um, over Samuelson spending. Uh, well, we can see it's going to be increasing in, uh, in the unemployment gap. So if we consider, you know, Typical case of, so of course, the elasticity of substitution, that's always positive. Z, it's always positive. And the typical case, M, the multiplier is positive, the unemployment multiplier. So typically, an increase in public spending reduces uh, the unemployment rate, right? So these are typical cases uh, on which, you know, we can focus. And so in these cases, we can see everything in front of the unemployment gap is positive. And so what we learn from that is that uh, stimulus spending is larger when the unemployment gap is larger. So here, no surprise, if you're facing a deeper recession, um, then you, you, know, you have to increase stimulus, uh, you have to have a larger stimulus spending, you have to increase public spending more above uh, Samuelson spending, okay? And that's because if you have a larger unemployment gap, you have larger inefficiencies, and so um, you want to spend more to try to tackle this, uh, to try to tackle these inefficiencies. Uh, so that, that's pretty obvious. Now, another thing we can look at is the role of the elasticity of substitution. Which is epsilon. So what's the impact of the elasticity of substitution on uh, stimulus spending? Well, you can see, so epsilon shows up in the numerator and the denominator. So if you want stimulus spending, um, it's basically a rational function of uh, the elasticity of substitution. And so we know this type of function in which you have epsilon in the numerator, epsilon in the denominator that way. So we know that uh, we know what's going to happen. So at, at epsilon equals zero, epsilon equals zero, 
what's going to happen is that there is no steam blue spending. Right, so you can see it immediately. If epsilon equals zero in the numerator, your stimulus spending is uh, zero. So no stimulus spending. By that, I mean that public spending has to stay at the Samuelson level. So that's obvious. If epsilon equals zero, we know is that when public and private goods are perfect um, complements, so they don't substitute for each other at all. Um, and so you are the Samuelson level. That's what's optimal. You know, in terms just looking at, at the allocation of resources between public and private goods. If you have inefficiencies, you don't want to increase, um, you know, you don't want to increase public spending over the Samuelson level because the elasticity of substitution is zero. That means that any additional public good has no value to society. Um, so this is this epsilon equals zero is a case, you know, that micro guys discuss often of like uh, digging holes, right? You just dig holes so you. The government hires workers, but what they do has no value, or you just, uh, it has no social value. And in a case like this in our model, if what people do has no social value, you shouldn't use stimulus spending at all, because uh, what you, you know, you take workers away from the private sector, put them in the public sector, but what they do has, brings no welfare, so there's no room for stimulus spending here, okay? Um, so if people dig holes, you shouldn't use stimulus spending. So here we don't have this like Keynesian logic that you hire people, what they do is useless, but you know, through multiplier effects, they are going to increase demand and somehow you will be able to increase private um, spending just from the fact that you hire these people. This doesn't occur in our model. Um, and in fact, in a world when this is true, you know, there is a sense in which it just cannot be true because if that was the case and you would always keep on spending more, uh, you would still keep on spending more until that multiplier goes below one and you're in a world in which um, you cannot just generate aggregate demand just by hiring people who do stuff that's useless. Uh, you know, if the multiplier is really like bigger than one in the way that people think, there is no really, you know, there is no trade-off by the government. You can just hire more people and that just will in itself create more aggregate demand then why stop there? Then just hire more, that will create more aggregate demand, that will create more private consumption. You can just, there's no trade-off, you just generate more and more and more welfare. Um, so obviously, you know, it doesn't look like the world is like this. It seems that in the real world, you're facing trade-offs. Um, so here we're in a world with trade-offs. So when you hire more people in the public sector, you're taking them away from the private sector. Now, if you take them away and what they do is useless, you don't want any of that. So epsilon zero, digging holes, uh, you don't want any stimulus spending. Then what you can see is that so epsilon is in the numerator denominator, but given how it enters in this rational function, we know that this function is going to be increasing in epsilon. Uh, so stimulus spending is increasing in epsilon, as we can see, given how epsilon enters. And so that means that uh, When there is higher substitutability, the stimulus package is larger. So this is just saying that if what the government does is you know closer to what the private sector does, then you want to then you know you should use more uh, stimulus spending. And the idea is that when you use stimulus spending, um, you know the cost of stimulus spending that you take away workers from the private sector, the public sector. But what if what they do in the public sector is a close substitute to what they would have done in the private sector? Then it's not really costly to actually move workers from the private to the public sector, and therefore you should use public, you should use stimulus spending more. Uh, and you shouldn't be afraid of the crowding out of the private sector by the public sector because, you know, for the households, these two things are, uh, you know, these two things become more and more interchangeable and therefore the welfare cost of the crowding out is becoming smaller and smaller. Uh, so stimulus spending is going to increase in epsilon. And then we can look at the case in which epsilon goes to infinity and uh, public and private goods are perfect substitute. Then you know, we know what's going to happen with epsilon going to infinity. We actually obtain uh, quite a simple formula. You can simplify so the formula for stimulus spending that GC minus GC star over GC star is equal. So if we take epsilon to infinity on both sides, then we'll get 
2M that's left in the top, the epsilon M, uh, M star that left in the bottom, the true epsilon will disappear, there's an M that will disappear, so we'll get 2 divided by the M times U0 minus U star over U star. So you can see that as epsilon goes to infinity, that's when the stimulus uh, package is the largest, and we can get a simple expression for uh, the stimulus package, which has this expression here. Uh, okay. So basically, the more substitutable probably good, the larger uh, stimulus package should be. Uh, you know, positive or in fact, uh, you should also have large negative stimulus packages if your economy is too tight. And the idea is that using public spending is less costly in a world like this because there is always crowding out public work of you know public work private workers by you know private employment by public employment but that's not very costly because public and private goods are heavily substitutable when the elasticity goes up. Um, so that's what we learned here. Last thing we can look at is the role of the multiplier. So this is an employment multiplier. So notice people often talk about an output multiplier, but in fact here in our framework, what we care about is the unemployment multiplier, because that's what captures the effect um, of um, public spending on Slack. And so, you know, th this type of framework suggests that there should be much more effort that's put into estimating this unemployment multiplier, because there's a sufficient statistics that we care about in this type of world with Slack, not the output multiplier in, uh, in itself. Um, of course, the, the two are related, and you know, depending on kind of the structure you put on the model, the two may be quite similar. In fact, in this paper I have with, um, with Emmanuel Saez, uh, the 2019 paper, uh, we show that in, the, in like in a simple matching model, the unemployment and output multiplier may be equivalent. So that's not too costly than to look at output multiplier, but there are setups in which they are not the same. Um, so what you would want, based on this formula, is actually to put more work into estimating estimating an unemployment multiplier. So what's the role of the multiplier? So you can see uh, the multiplier again sh here shows in the numerator and denominator, but in the denominator, the multiplier is uh, squared here. And so that's going to uh, lead to interesting properties um, because what we can see is that uh, what we can see is that, in fact, the stimulus spending will be a non-monotonous function of the multiplier. So here again, we have a rational function, but it's a linear, you know, it's a polynomial of order one in the numerator and a polynomial of order two in the denominator. And so what happens when you have functions like this is that, in fact, as we can see here, the function will be increasing for small multipliers and then it's going to peak and then it's going to decrease for larger multipliers. Uh, so that, that's really quite uh, interesting. So m equals zero if the multiplier is zero should have no stimulus spending. And that we know why, it's because the multiplier is zero, public spending has no effect on unemployment, on stabilization, and so we are back in a we are back in a Samuelsonian world. So GC is equal to GC star. Okay, but then what we see is that uh, initially stimulus spending Uh, so for small m, stimulus spending is increasing in m. So here you get the idea that um, if public spending is more powerful, you want to spend more. You know, if the multiplier is larger, you want to spend more. And that's, you know, an intuition that a lot of people have. Or if we, have, you know, often that's a discussion that surrounds um, empirical work on the multiplier, people find large multiplier and they say, oh, we should spend more. So here that's what happened. But this is true only for small multiplier. Um, then, you know, stimulus spending uh, peak at some medium multiplier. And we can compute that multiplier. Uh, you now what you can do is you can take the derivative of this thing here with respect to M, uh, and you find the spot where this, ex this, this thing is maximized, and that will be for some medium multiplier. Uh, and you know, in the paper, in the, in the paper with size, uh, we actually get an expression for M. It's not very hard to get it. Uh, you know, I mean, in fact, we could uh, we could do it very quickly. So where does the stimulus spending peak? Uh, well. 
you have to you have to find the spot where uh, that's pretty easy. So we we want the derivative of so this expression, which is uh, two epsilon m divided by one plus z epsilon m square with respect to m is equal to zero. That's going to give us the peak of this. We are still loose spending peaks. Uh, So this gives um, two epsilon divided by the term there, minus two epsilon m divided by the terms in the bottom square uh, times z epsilon m and two uh, z epsilon m. So this is our derivative. It has to be equal to zero. So then if we multiply, so we get 2 epsilon times 1 plus z epsilon m square minus, so here we have 4 epsilon square m square is equal to 0. So that gives us 2 epsilon plus 2 epsilon square m square minus 4 epsilon square m square is equal to 0. Okay, and so we get 2 epsilon has to be equal to 2 epsilon square m square. Well, so actually it's, oh, there's a z somewhere, right? 2 epsilon, 2 epsilon square. Oh, yeah, here there's a 2 z epsilon. Okay. So 2 epsilon has to be equal to uh, 4 minus 2 z epsilon square m square epsilon square m square 4 minus 2 z great and so you find that therefore the m that maximizes is going to be 2 epsilon divided by 4 minus 2 z Epsilon square, so it's equal to, we can get rid of the two epsilon, it's one over, we get rid of the two, that's two minus z, we get rid of the epsilon, epsilon, all right. So this is a, this is a multiplier that actually maximizes stimulus spending. Uh, it's one divided to two minus z epsilon. So, you know, it's a multiplier and it's positive and that maximizes, uh, at that multiplier, that maximizes stimulus spending, okay? And then after that, uh, so we can call it, you know, M star. And the key thing is that after M greater than M star, so when you have even larger multipliers and the stimulus spending uh, decreases with M. Okay, so here you have larger and larger multipliers and you want to spend less and less. And so you may wonder why this seems very strange. Usually we think big multiplier, big spending. No, because the idea is that, you know, you never want to do more than just filling the unemployment gap. And as your multiplier becomes larger and larger, you, you know, it becomes easier and easier to fill the unemployment gap. And so if you have a very large multiplier, just a small amount of public spending will, you know, fill a large amount of the unemployment gap. So as your multiplier become larger and larger, you need less and less spending to fill the majority of your unemployment gap. And so, you know, uh, so, if, so if you have large multipliers, actually the more powerful the policy, the less you want of the policy, you know, the policy has a deviation from Samuelson because you just need very little to fill most of your unemployment gap. So that's the logic. Um, and so that's why it's a home shape, you know, the stimulus spending is a home shape function of, uh, of the multiplier, you know, it's going to look something like this. So if you put multiplier and then here, if you put stimulus spending, you, you know, we know that when the multiplier is zero, stimulus spending is zero, then you'll get something like this and then it'll um, converge toward, uh, it's going to converge toward zero and then 
this multiplier that maximizes that the one we've just computed is one divided by two minus z epsilon. Uh, but so there is a whole region where larger multipliers actually mean less stimulus spending, uh, which you know people never talk about. But in fact, it's pretty intuitive if you're you know. And sometimes people find massive multiplier and they say, oh, we should spend a lot. But no, if you find a massive multiplier, you need very little of your policy to actually address all the inefficiencies and fill unemployment gaps. Um, so if your multiplier is really massive, you don't need all that much spending at all. Uh, okay, so um, unemployment multiplier, you have interesting properties. You have a hump shape response of the stimulus spending to multiplier. Stimulus spending is always increasing in the elasticity of institution, and it's also increasing in the uh, in the unemployment gap. So these are the, the properties, uh, and so, so it's quite you know it's quite different from this idea that now notice also that a multiplier being like more than one or less than one has absolutely no impact. The only thing that matters is the sign of the multiplier. But if your multiplier is positive, all of this is true. It doesn't need you know more than one, less than one has no role at all here. Um, the only thing is. You know, and so this, this I think is good also for empirical research. You don't need to obsess about trying to find multipliers bigger than one, like people do, to justify stimulus spending. As long as your multiplier is positive, you need to have some stimulus spending. And in fact, then when the multiplier is a bit bigger, you need more stimulus spending. And at some point, once you uh, reach the, the threshold, in fact, even bigger multipliers will mean less stimulus spending. So the larger stimulus spending is for medium multipliers. Um, and if you want to have a bit of evidence on what the size of the unemployment multiplier, um, Valerie Remy has a good survey on the, and good evidence on M, the, multi, the unemployment multiplier, which is minus the UDG. So you can look at um, you can look at that survey. I think it's a 2000, um, it's a 2013 survey on uh, the evidence that provides evidence on the unemployment multiplier. Um, but roughly, you know, the multiplier seems this unemployment multiplier in terms of values, it seems less than one, uh, but positive. Uh, so a, a median estimate, um, I think in Valerie's work is uh, M around 0 0.5. So, you know, that's kind of a number to have in mind. So when you increase, um, public spending by one percentage point, uh, then you're going to reduce the unemployment rate by about uh, 0.5 um, percentage point, if I remember correctly. Um, it was something like this. Um, 